Good afternoon and welcome to Beanstalk.Global. My name is Max McGillivray. Welcome to our second webinar in this uh, series. Um, if you're not aware already, uh, Beanstalk.Global is a social enterprise that supports, educates and promotes the global fresh food sector uh, to help it to thrive and grow. Uh, through this webinar series, we're looking to not educate, but inform, especially in this very difficult period that we're all in, to try and give some, not influence, but some, um, but a bit of humour, um, a, a bit of an intelligence, um, but utilising our key experts to give you some information as to how we think the sector is progressing and to give you some advice as we go through this, uh, uh, this, this scenario. Uh, what I want to do first initially is just to, also got to get this the right way around, is to thank our sponsors here. Without our sponsors who very kindly uh, backed us to get to this uh, point in time, we would not be able to be uh, streaming to you now and to deploy all the other initiatives that we are, we are looking to do. We'd also like to thank you um, from our uh, webinar early in the, in the week uh, where we had some uh, really interesting speakers on board. We had nearly a thousand people uh, dialed in or and who've uh, looked at the record. So it's been a big thumbs up from, from yourself and also the positive re reviews that we've gained. Um, what I'd, I'd like to do um, initially is just um, uh, get, get the speakers to say hello so you know who we've got in the room. So no particular order. Uh, Belinda, can you say hello to everyone? Hi everyone, my name's Belinda Clark and I'm the director of Agritech E, which is a membership network organization bringing together farmers and growers with innovators to build an innovation ecosystem. Nigel. Hello from Austria. So uh, I'm Nigel <laughs> Trude. Uh, I like to say that. I, I live in Austria, so hello from here. Um, my background, I studied life at Sainsbury's, then I was at PepsiCo, uh, then at Red Bull, where I ran, ran the UK business, and then I worked for Fresca for uh, seven years, and now I'm non executing in the UK when I can, obviously, when I can get back. And over to Mr Ward, Rob Ward in London. Hi, it's Rob Ward from uh, central London in a very uh, strange place it is at the moment. Yes, uh, we run a business called forwardfood.tech, and we help uh, food and ag tech businesses grow and find uh, fundraising as well, to raise investment. Started the first, most part of my life as a farmer, right through to being a retailer, so I feel like I've been both sides of the fence here. Excellent, thanks Rob. And Mr Crawford from Ghana. Well, no, I'm currently in Cambridgeshire, but um, my name is Mark Crawford. I'm head of sales and marketing for Blue Skies. Um, we are an exotic uh, fruit company um, that provides cut fruit to European retailers. Um, our particular challenge at the moment is our entire business model is based on air freight, uh, on passenger airlines. So you can imagine it's quite uh, challenging at the moment. Thanks, guys. So we've got a really interesting range of speakers. Just to try and get um, everyone warmed up, uh, I have, haven't uh, told them uh, of this, but let, let's just start with Belinda. Belinda, uh, name the name, give us the name of your largest pet, please. So I have a herd of alpacas. <laughs> and uh, if anyone, the, the next question is always why, and the answer to that is because I love them hugely and unconditionally, and they make me be mindful. Yay, fantastic. Right, uh, uh, Nigel, have you got any alpacas mm -hmm. in Austria? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mark, now you are an athlete um, in that, uh, when, when we <laughs> look at your face, uh, when, 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 when was it? Was it uh, autumn of last year that you were due to go to Hawaii? Uh, no, I didn't qualify, sadly. Um, so I do Ironman triathlons. Um, but in the qualification race last year, um, I managed to hit a wall at uh, 34 and a half miles an hour. Um, so uh, ended up in the back of an ambulance rather than um, finishing the marathon. So, so, so just, 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 just for the curiosity of us other athletes, obviously not me myself, just talk us through the five seconds before the crash and the five seconds after the crash. And, and also you've got to build in the Gs, the G-forces the G that you hit, um, literally. Five seconds before, I was about 10 miles away from going from bike to run. So I was concentrating and thinking, right, how am I going to get off the bike and carry on running? Uh, five seconds afterwards, ouch, uh, bounce, 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 bother. Poor chap. And, and, and are, are you all knitted, that, knitted back together now? Uh, a few holes, but yes, basically. I'm. Well done. Nigel, you have mm -hmm. got the most gorgeous daughter. Describe your new baby daughter to us, please. Oh, that made me smile. Yeah, so I have a nine-month-old uh, baby daughter called Emma, and she's, she's one of the reasons why 
I now live in Innsbruck in Austria and she's, uh, she's absolutely beautiful and, and it's one of the benefits of being uh, locked in, of which I've done 13 days so far uh, because I get to spend lots of time with my little daughter and my wife, obviously. So. Fantastic, Nigel. Now, Rob, um, I, I didn't know how to, how to mention this, but um, do you know, I reckon I've seen you butt naked about a half a dozen times. Can you, can you remember when? <laughs> Uh, yes, we were at college together, weren't we, Max? So, uh, yes, it's a horrible thought, that. And um, uh, you weren't going to mention it, I'm sure. You... <laughs> I, I never got the money. <laughs> Just, uh, Rob did a fantastic job when we were both at Harper. That you, you were the social secretary, um, and he had the, um, um, uh, the, the task of trying to sort out some um, amazing bands coming into Sears. And when, I, was, I was trying to remember the, um, I'll never remember the, 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 the name of the band, but you, every time you seem to have a success in getting major acts in, the rugger buggers always seem to strip you naked, but you didn't seem well, to, well, it's not that you didn't seem to mind. You, well, you they, seem to they just were very much, I, I one time booked two PA systems and no band, so we had two PA systems and no band, and that was uh, not the most success of the evening, so um, yeah. Uh, I was only 19. <laughs> no, no, it's a, you, you did a fantastic job. It was good fun. Great. Right, guys. Right, guys. Let's let's get in, into this. So we've we've got um, a, a subject title, if I can remember. Is this the end of the retailers' monopoly globally of fresh food? As we all look to go direct with the grower producer due to the supply issues created by COVID nineteen. And I just wanted to go with a with a, a bit of a state of the nation um, speech for myself, and that I got contacted by a number of. Um, uh, growers and fresh produce companies uh, yesterday, knowing that I was going to go live with, uh, with, with you guys. I suppose that the main bit that I picked up yesterday is that there's um, a definite concern that uh, in a week's time, our UK borders will be closed. Uh, that, that, that's it, which seem to be going to that rate. And you just look at what, ha what has happened over the lunchtime news with the, the new, with the announcement that Boris Johnson and the health secretary have gone down with, uh, with COVID-19. But just going back to this, the borders being closed, if the borders do get closed, um, that means that everyone who's in the UK now will be picking the UK crop. So in effect, we're not going to have enough people. Whatever the, the numbers are, we're going to be short by 80,000 people. Therefore, the UK crop has to be picked by UK people. Um, it's great that there's been a, a flurry of uh, publicity trying to get people um, out into the fields. And even the, um, the clickbait Daily Mail has been running a, a heavy article on that today. Belinda, don't shoot me for looking at the Daily Mail. The, um, but, the, uh, the, the, but the concern seems to be is that, that we've gone off too early trying to get those people um, attracted to the, this, this working um, element. And will they still want to work when we actually get into it? Um, and as such, one of the um, growers I was speaking to was saying that their view is that the minimum rate should be scrapped for this period that we're going through. And we should go into peace rates and even uh, eliminate tax and make those peace rates cash that people are paid at the end of, um, end of, end of a field when they've got, the, got their fruit on a, on a, on a, on a cashless um, basis, but they're paid cash with no, with no tax. I don't, that might be a bit, of, a bit of a controversial view, but we do have this looming car crash over and above everything else. So we're not gonna get this, this, this crop picked uh, for, for, the, for, the, uh, for, for the summer. Uh, and the other bit that we're picking up on, and Rob and Nigel and I spoke about this earlier when we were testing the IT, that we're not looking to do any retail bashing. But this particular grower is very concerned that one <laughs> supermarket has already turned off um, the purchasing of certain um, uh, fresh produce lines as that retailer moves to frozen and uh, non-perishables to, to ease up their supply chain. So where's that going to leave that grower that they've got the double whammy of not enough labor and, and nowhere to sell, sell, the, sell the produce? So we do seem to be in this conundrum and that's why we wanted to run with this this title today of uh, when this all, all settles out will we be in a different um, position retail wise because people will uh, be encouraged to buy on a, on, on a more local basis um, or will we just go back back to type and just before I hand over to, to you guys um, I don't know if you can see this I, I didn't have the tech to be able to get this um, set up so this came from David Potter of G's and this is basically Italy's sales line of, of uh, fresh produce. Um, and, and so you can see where the spike is when everyone, everyone went out to panic buy, and then it settled out um, pretty quickly. And again, that's what we're going to see, I, I believe, within the UK, that we're going through this panic buying status stage at the moment. Um, as we said in the webinar early in the week, we're already hitting 30% uh, food wastage levels because people are buying products and then realizing they can't, can't store it. There is not a huge 
issue in the supply chain in the respect of the food is out there. It's just getting it um, on, onto shelf. Um, so the, the, all the, this massive um, sales increase that we've seen, is that just going to uh, fall away? And we're going to get uh, back to normal uh, within a period of weeks as we work through this period, this isolation period, as we, as we all sit here. So, so the whole thing is, is very, very much in, in flux. Um, I, I suppose, um, Nigel, if it's okay to, to turn over to you, because you gave some really interesting views as to the difference between uh, the UK and Austria. What's different in Austria from what you're picking up in the, in the UK, please? Um, well, it's a little less uh, complicated as a, as a country. So its population is, is 9 million. It's also culturally quite compliant. So um, it, when people get instructed what to do, then they tend to follow it. It's also been probably clearer earlier on about the plan. Um, and what I observed sit, sort of sitting here and looking at the UK is that people went and panicked by because they weren't quite sure of what was happening. Um, and I, but I have to say now, if you look at what's happening, the, the way the retailers have actually managed to manage this into an orderly fashion, um, you see today is, is, is a lot better than, say, five days ago. Um, so, uh, we, you know, Austria is, is a different, different country. But, um, Nigel, did you see panic buying in Austria? A little bit, but not, not to the same magnitude again, because um, there, um, there's a lot more independent shops here as well. So... Um, they don't, not everyone is destination supermarket. Um, they're, 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 the supermarkets tend to be more regional, apart from there is an Aldi and Lidl business here, but a lot, there's a lot more farm, um, specifically in the area of Innsbruck. Um, and I think that the government, they were really clear, um, and therefore there was a really mad Saturday. Um, and then things seem to settle down. And, and we've got the opposite issue here now, where no, nobody's actually going out very often. Oh. Um, and the store, the supermarkets are pretty empty. Uh, people aren't buying that much. And actually the farm um, shop community is thriving. So there's a lot of, um, you can go and pick your um, products up, obviously including fresh produce, uh, at the local farm. And the farms have begun to change their model in that they're procuring other things outside of their core products. So they may have offered before fresh produce now they're offering uh, milk bread uh, Rice, okay. butter mm -hmm. so uh and that's and that's definitely having a bit of an impact on some of the supermarkets for sure okay uh, mark can we just pass over to you so i've made this 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 comment about the food wastage um especially within specific lines of, uh, of fresh uh, blue skies blue skies operate out of ghana benin uh, egypt south africa and brazil uh, doing prep fruits back into the UK and the European markets. What's the last two, three weeks been like for yourselves, please? Um, so when it was all starting, sales went up quite a lot. I mean, we had across Europe, we saw a, a sales increase of probably 20%, um, but then it crashed and it crashed hugely as well. Um, but we're now seeing sales are starting to recover. Um, we're seeing day by day, things are getting back to normal, um, but volumes are still down by in excess of 20, 30%. Um, it seems to be, so I'll reflect Nigel's comment, you, it, it's different in different countries, very definitely. Um, we've seen the effects in, um, so for example, France is on really heavy lockdown and their volumes have disappeared to the floor. Um, meanwhile, Holland has been locked down for longer than the UK and we're seeing that recovery come through. So we've got some hope that over the next week and beyond this weekend, we'll start to get back to some form of normal. Um, the big issue has been this massive spike in sales and then a big drop as well, which the retailers just couldn't cope with. Nearly all of them, not all of them, but nearly all of them had um, systemic uh, distribution problems, which meant that products were left in the wrong place, they couldn't pick it up, they couldn't get it through the supply chain. Um, but once you start, once we start to see things flatten out and get into uh, a sort of a new level, I, I think I think things will settle down. Okay. And my gut feeling is that volumes in the long term in the retail environment will be fairly stable um, because you know, the food service is switched off. Okay, and, and Mark, um, did, Mark, did you pick up what we picked up last week that people are buying more fresh produce? Um, but they tended to buy uh, packaged fresh produce because they, they have a view that loose fresh produce might be, God forbid, contaminated. Are you seeing that with your sales? 
it's, it's, it, to be honest, um, it depends by retailer. There appear to be, um, have like a different uh, attitudes of shoppers. Um, some are being uh, irrational, some are being more rational, but it, it really depends by region and by retailer. Okay. Um, so pick your choice. Okay, um, um, Mark, one question I've, I've been meaning to ask you for the last week. It's a very pertinent time to ask you. Um, I've, I've been uh, very blessed to have been to your site in, in Ghana, and I've helped um, a plane from your site uh, be uh, packed up. Um, and it's normally a daily uh, British Airways plane going out of Accra back to, uh, back to Heathrow, a passenger plane with passenger numbers four in a way. Um, how are you physically getting the product back to the UK? Um, with difficulty, to be honest. I mean, our... Um... Our logistics team are producing so many rabbits out of a hat. It's unbelievable. Um, but we, we're changing every day between airlines. Um, we are using some air freighters. So there is, you know, remember that I think London Heathrow handles 70 billion pounds a year of air freight. Um, so there are still air freighters flying and we're trying to get volumes on those. Um, but it varies. So, for example, uh, yesterday morning at uh, eight o'clock in the morning, South Africa time, the South African government announced they were shutting their airspace from today, um, which uh, creates some issues. So it, it's very variable. We are getting through. We've got increased costs. So um, some of the freighters are landing in Ostend, Frankfurt, places like that, and we're trucking it back to the UK in order to continue supplying the UK. And here comes the question, can you pass those increased costs on to your customer? Um, on the whole, I have to say our customers have been brilliant. Um, Great. On the brilliant. whole, okay. they have come forward and they've accepted, you know, we've had to give evidence and we're sharing costs and things like that, but um, they've accepted the price rises um, and also have moved their payment term, which you know, we are having to pay for uh, air freight yeah. up front. So the cash just has been sort of sucked out of the business. And the major, most of them have come forward really helpfully and cut payment terms dramatically, which has freed up our cash flow and made life a lot easier than it could have been. No, that, well, that's fantastic to hear that there's been that flexibility on that side. And we've got to applaud that. because I don't think that's actually coming through um, through, through the system or, or the media that there's been that flexibility with, within the trade. So that, that's great. That's great. Thank, th thank you to, to, to the retailers and, uh, and, and your other customers for having that flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Belinda, with Agritech E, you're, you're more centric within the UK um, agribusiness sector, if that's okay to, uh, to say. What, what are you seeing um, over this last two week pe period with your with your, with your client bank, what, what's the view? What's the thought? How, how are they going to work their way through it? So I think to start with, everyone's just been hunkering down, trying to get to grips with technology, accepting some early inefficiencies while we all get used to communicating from our home offices uh, and keeping the wheels on the bus of, of their own businesses. Um, I was reflecting on your exam question, that Max, and as you would expect, uh, every scientist, which I was 100 years ago, always then says, well, actually, I don't like the question. So it was the wrong question. And I'm just kind of interested in the challenge that uh, there's an implicit assumption in the question that the retailers have a monopoly on fresh food. And a lot of our uh, farmer members are actually growing product that is, is not consumable. So it's feed wheat, uh, it's oilseed grapes, some of which uh, doesn't go to, to human consumption, sugar beet, for example. So there's some quite interesting thinking going on about what that could mean uh, in the light of what we've just talked about. Is it a pivot to consumable food that you can sell direct to consumers or to retailers? Or do you then actually pivot into you know, the natural capital ecosystem services space if um, the, the current climate means that actually you can't grow things that people will be able to eat directly and the supply chains have all um, started to get a bit messed up? So, so Belinda, are you criticizing me in, in the respect of the, of the, comment, the, the, the comment that I always come out with is that whatever the, the exact figure is that 85% of all fruit and veg is sold within the retail sector. But as you say, um, your, uh, your uh, membership, if they're growing wheat or rape, a lot of that is going into, and, but it's still fresh food. Ultimately, it's still fresh food. A, a class combine, whatever the co uh, quote that um, uh, Trevor Turrell comes out with makes uh, 
potentially is it is it uh, two hundred thousand loaves a day, um, and that's going, but it's still fresh food. So so is, is that so you're is just that, counting everything that's ever grown as fresh food? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> okay so then there's the conversation then about the food service sector and the wider supply chain and who then where the monopoly sits yeah okay you're so, supposed to be ans asking the questions aren't you I'll shut up. yeah so i'm going to bat it over to rob now R so rob has got a very interesting background in that he used to own a very successful farm shop in uh, in, in shropshire and he's very well why um, especially with that he has so so rob what what is your view of where we are in the respect of your of your of, of your uh, contacts your clients um, well, the, the farm shop industry is having an incredible resurgence, which is fantastic. I guess the question um, for them will be, is, that, is this simply because they can't get it in the supermarket and therefore they are just filling in a gap? Yep. Or more importantly, are they going to change behaviour? And I'm hoping for the latter. Um, interestingly, back in the 80s, we were selling strawberries, growing strawberries and selling them to the supermarkets. And there were no Eastern Europeans then, and, or even the hops or sauce scheme. And uh, we relied on uh, Bangladesh, Indian, West Indian, and unemployed people to pick our fruit. And I can tell you, it was a breath of fresh air when these new prunes were available in the 90s. So um, if, if we think we're going to get this fruit picked with uh, British labour, we've got another thing coming here. So we've got a huge problem to fix. That's yeah. a really important thing to say. I think that, that we've got to get on that. And I, I really don't know what the solution is if the borders are down. But even the government wasn't keen about it before the borders were a problem. Um, but yeah, as a, as a retailer, um, frustrations, we became retailers out of the frustration of working with the supermarkets. I, we built a very good business with them, and, um, but what was interesting is how they evolved over the decades. Um, sounding like an, old, uh, an old, old man here, but I remember in the 80s, um, m and used to give us the packaging and, uh, and do free pickups from the farm. Wow. Of days. And, and no crate hire charges, um, all the rest of it. And then Tesco's came along and... Um, they were like uh, the new kids in the block and, you know, wanted a coffee around the, you know, the kitchen table and put their arm around you and said, what can we do to help your business? And uh, yeah, that was great. We were the first to supply them with raspberries in 1991. And, uh, and yet they, they sort of evolved and the cultures within the supermarket chains. We had a frustration, really. Um, we got into farm shops and farmers markets and they were incredible, uh, incredible thing. It's interesting how they had a big boom in the foot and mouth yeah, 2001, when, um, okay. when, when, when it's arguably there was a shutdown of some sort there, nothing obviously like now. Um, but my, now my wish uh, and hope for the pet industry is that it's, it, it's all about quality retailing as well as quality food. So quality retailing is convenience, great service, great products, good value for money, because overall it seems good value for money. And people are now seeing that again in the amazing farm shops that we have all over the country. And, and that's in the markets as well. I think that's another, don't forget, that's a huge opportunity. But, but, but Rob, Rob, is it a bit of a false dawn thinking that the likes of the farm shops are going to be um, ever popular on the basis that we are a very urban population? L look at you in, in central uh, London, that you can't obviously easily get to um, a farm shop. Therefore, we're going to see the ascendancy of more um, d delivery schemes. Um, I, with, I mean, with the, okay, so... I think there's a lot of people live out of London, but the people in cities, wherever they are, um, could look at retailing in a very different way in the way that they are in, more often in Europe. And Borough, which is next door to me, Borough Market, is a fantastic example where it's beautiful product. And actually, a lot of it's not super, you know, supermarket money either for the fresh produce. No. Um, but the, I think rethinking the whole supply chain is where we could go next with this. And actually within that, just really question a lot of costs that have been incurred and find ways to completely revolutionise how we can get fantastic products from the farm to a consumer. That's what I'm really excited about this opportunity. So, so, so Rob, on that side, isn't the answer yeah. Amazon fresh produce? So I, I've been banging on for the last couple of years predicting that Amazon's going to come in like a juggernaut and take over this whole, uh, this whole home delivery sector because we've all got an Amazon account. We've all got an Amazon Prime, Prime account. It's there to be had, but they haven't come in. And, and, and we've been a bit confused as to why Amazon haven't come, come in to, to, well, to dominate. And, and hold on, is that, is that because they've worked out that there is so little margin in fresh foods in comparison to stationary or car parts or camera equipment? What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, the, the problem with um, fresh food online delivered is not, at, um, the whole point of online is convenient. And um, primarily, that's the, it's the reason why Amazon is so successful all the other categories it's in. But when you come to produce, you've then got a supply chain to turn on to match that order, or that you have it ready to sell, which has got high risk of wastage. 
so th this is this is where it becomes a lot more complicated mm -hmm. with a what is you know an instant order to an instant delivery I, I think there's other ways of doing this and um, and actually I'd rather see a combination of um, uh, of volu voluntary work I mean look at the amazing things happen now around people wanting to help other people in our communities I think there's a there's a whole reset in Britain of going on how we think and behave about everything not just food but with food could be it's going to be so core you know the, the other side of this hideous uh, catastrophe right now is that I suspect we're going to think about food and our health a great deal more yes because the people that are physically resilient are going to are going to you know will get through the virus very quickly the ones that aren't won't yeah okay 20, 20 the lower 20 percent quartile of our, our of earners in the UK are spending 50 percent more than their food than everybody else yeah. And that, that's hurting fresh produce because they see that as expensive per calorie. Yep, yep. Mm. So, we, so can I, so we, I can just, can we, I just swap over to Nigel? Nigel, with your ex-retail head on and your ex-branding uh, head on with, uh, with Red Bull and, and um, with, with your experience with, of Mac, what, what's your view? Can you, can you see this whole supply chain dynamic changing when we're out of this um, horrendous period? Or is it just going to revert back to type? No, to a degree it will, but I think that um, I think that uh, the supermarkets um, have such a strong logistics platform, not not only in location of stores, but also in the online. Uh, if anything else on top at the moment is maybe distress or whatever, but you've ultimately got to be able to add value, haven't you? Um, and I, and I and I uh, I'll tell you one thing about the whole Amazon experience because I was personally uh, supplying Amazon Fresh. Okay. for a couple of years and they had uh, they had uh, the distribution in the total um, London area and the biggest issue was about quality delivery in terms of uh, people were not confident enough in that what was going to get delivered to their door was going to be of the right quality and yep. they were not prepared to take that risk and that that's one of the benefits of retailers where they've worked hard at their their own personal brand and when you walk into a Sainsbury's you believe um, that the quality is going to be good and, and you have the opportunity to physically see it. And if you go online, which obviously a lot of people did and, and now really are trying hard, in most cases, they, they, they probably feel confident in that what they're going to receive is going to be of a high quality. So um, one of the things that's really important for any model to change is about the quality delivery, consistency of quality. Um, because to, to Rob's point, um, a lot of people... Uh, find produce expensive and maybe deviate away from it. So if you are going to buy it, you need to be pretty sure what you're getting is value for money. Yep. Okay. And, and guys, I don't know if you've just seen on the on the Q and A session. Um, everyone watching in, you can ask us questions as uh, as we go through, and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible. We're forgetting one key element here: food service. Food service has been so dramatically hit because we're obviously not going to the hotels and restaurants and. Uh, uh, an anonymous uh, individual stated here, food service has been hit by the COVID-19 situation. Why isn't more products switching across? There are a much bigger sector than farm shops, correct? And could supply through more uh, uh, via the delivery capacity. Uh, Mark, what, go on, Mark. On that one. I think um, people are switching, it's taking time. But if you think we're only, what, 10 days into this uh, from the UK's point of view, and I'm already hearing stories of um, food service focused wholesalers who are moving into home delivery very, very quickly. But it does take time. And it's, it's the um, nitty gritty of boxes, of packing stations, of you know, having areas where you can consolidate small amounts of product into a one area. So I think we'll see that change very quickly um, because these guys are fighting for their survival and they've lost 90 95 percent of their business i mean yeah. you know fred shut down completely starbucks shut theirs as well i would imagine compass every single canteen every single office canteen is closed now in london and things like this but it's also an opportunity because and i'll i'll make a generalization here but whenever i go into food service outlets across the uk they tend to be, uh, the, the counter or the front of staff people tend to be Eastern European. And the same as our fruit pickers. And last week, 2 million people lost their job in the food service sector. And a huge number of those are young and incredibly work orientated. And I do, my, my hope is that we will see a shift of people 
from working in food service to being prepared to pick the crops. So there literally last week, two million people lost their jobs. How many do we need in fresh produce? 80,000. There you go, 10%. So less than 10%, 5% of those people that lost their jobs last week can change into fresh produce. And we've got every single person that we need to pick this crop. And I don't think there's a, there will be an excuse this year not to have crop picked because of people. They're there and they want to work. Mark, Mark well, well said. And remember my comment that if it might be being a bit alarmist, but if the borders do get closed in a, in a week's time, the people who are in the UK now are the people who will pick the UK crop. And I don't know if any of you saw, it was announced over um, lunchtime that uh, in Israel, um, they're deploying their young to go out and pick their crop on the basis that they're, they're, um, they're, they are or about to close their borders. So Israel, Israel have already gone in front and uh, stated that. In fact, those, those people are already here. They're not going anywhere um, yep. and they're unemployed. And I know from all the people that I've worked with in factories and on shop floors over the years, they are so motivated. It is unbelievable. Okay. And once you show them how to pick something, they'll be full of field. Okay. So, 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 so guys, how, as a food sector, as a fresh food sector, how can we make it as appealing as possible for that potential two million to come, come over the, the, this way and help with the UK crop? It was quite normal um, in the decades and decades ago for half of London to go on holiday to Ken. Yeah. Um, and that's how they, they, they saw it as a good, good fun. It was out fresh air and um, they'd have parties at night. And I think a lot of these modern fr fruit farms, we were doing it um, when, we were, when we were in the fruit business, but they've got amazing facilities and they're highly, highly regulated and checked and, um, and they're very good at, um, you know, palliative care. You know, they are very good at um, helping helping the, um, to, to make sure they're looked after with doctors and uh, yep. you know, buses but to also, but also that, that's so the market. Right. It could be very attractive to, to these people to get back out, get some sun on the back and um, earn some money and have a good time. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the challenges, I, I remember working in a, a, a very well-known lettuce company um, and they have, uh, they have large porter cabins with beds in them and they, you know, they offer that uh, facility to stay but we can't at the moment with COVID-19 because of the social distancing. Mm. And I, I think that's probably going to be the biggest logistical problem mm. is that um, mm. if we're going to keep it under control and keep people social distance, the not antibody in test. the fields, but in the evenings at night. The antibody test might uh, fix that. I hope so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and, if, and, and, and if we believe Donald Trump, it's all going to be over by Easter. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Belinda, can I ask a question of you, please? Um, from another anonymous source, uh, a, a techie question. Regardless of whether retailers have the monopoly or not, it seems clear that there needs to be more robust information sharing technology in place between the grower, producer, and the food service businesses or and the retailer to the customer to facilitate, facilitate providing all par parties this transparency and this traceability. Is blockchain the best solution? Maybe. There are some examples where blockchain is being deployed in the agri-food sector. Uh, tea growing in Malawi, for example, there's also some use in the livestock sector uh, around traceability. Very possibly, uh, I think blockchain got a bit of a bad rep uh, around Bitcoin. Uh, it still remains a technology of huge potential. And when you sort of run the, the sort of theoretical uh, argument about what it could do, um, it's, it's really over, overwhelming. However, I do think we have a way to go before it is deployed. But smart ledger, uh, smart contracts, distributed ledger technology, I think all of those kind of things could really help with, with the data. And just to kind of come back to the COVID-19 situation we're in at the moment, I think what we've seen is some very fast uh, reacting across the, the supply chain and certainly with the retailers around data sharing, things like um, absenteeism, the number of staff self-isolating, shopper behaviour around stockpiling, uh, all of those kinds of new, new behaviours and new pieces of data that are being shared. So I, I guess the hope is that this kind of fleet of foot reactive, very fast focused around a grand challenge, and is there a bigger challenge than COVID-19 at the moment, that that kind of mindset and will to collaborate, use data to share and gain new insights across the value chain could actually really be very powerful in our post-COVID-19 world.
the match we're seeing a lot in food tech the food tech businesses we're working with and and ag tech supply chain ones and there's going to be a leap in uh, potentially in technologies that are going to transform both costs and um, the transparency that we could see within the supply chain so this is an amazing opportunity now for the, the bigger businesses out there to think well how where's the innovation going to come from and it, it's sitting there already in many cases with the early stage scale up tech businesses that are trying yeah. to reinvent the supply chain from QA systems to, to traceability systems, right through to stock control, all kinds of incredible technologies that we're working with. And they're desperate to link up with the big businesses. And actually, because big businesses have scale and they have innovation, the two should come together. Uh, and it's something that we're working on um, okay. in our business to, to, to part of that. Uh, Belinda, Belinda I, can't, I think it must be two, three years ago, you, you held a very um, impressive um, uh, conference at the House of Lords and you had John Shropshire, um, mm -hmm. OBE, um, Ch Chairman of the G's Group, um, uh, give, give a little uh, intro and it was fascinating what he said and I, I won't be able to quote him directly, but he basically said that the speed of technology in the last 10 years has been um, so magnified um, in, increase in comparison to um, his first 50 years, formative 50 years in, in, in agriculture. Um, within the last six months, we're aware of some uh, trials on robotics and some uh, of picking robotics in, in some uh, areas of fresh produce within the UK that got canned. Mm -hmm. With the situation we're in at the moment, can, uh, alluding to what Rob has just stated, can you see that this is now going to get accelerated, that there will be, there'll be uh, government money thrown at this um, area to try uh, um, and make sure we're never in this position before. You've all heard me say this this line before that we are but four missed meals from anarchy, uh, and we could be there. We could be there now. We could, we could literally have looting in the streets if we don't we don't get the um, uh, the, the food in the store. Um, Belinda, can you see that there there will be a sea change in the respect of that whole IT ro robotic element? Yeah, I mean the UK has already been investing very heavily in this uh, for some years. The robotics is moving quite fast. The University of Lincoln, for example, has just become one of the largest trainers of PhDs in agricultural robotics. And I'm minded, you mentioned John Shropshire, I'm minded of an event I was at the day after the Brexit vote. And, and if we can remember back how traumatised we all were about Brexit, and if only we knew what was to come. But John Shropshire said then, the, the day after the Brexit vote, that this was going to help, this, this will uh, encourage them to accelerate and augment their investment and commitment to technologies and robotics, then it was through the lens of labor supply. But I do think that um, given where we are currently and also the, uh, the challenges around the labor supply, there is going to be an increased focus on how we can use the technology to increase efficiency and sustainability in the food chain. We were already on that trajectory and have been for some years, but I do think that uh, this, is, this is going to be a very persuasive factor to enhance and accelerate that. You're going to be ideally, not trying to be mercenary on your behalf, but you're going to be ideally placed for, for, for that, are you not, when we get through this period? I, I hope so. I mean, to, to the point about connecting up the small innovators with the big companies, and I think that's one of the other um, things that I was thinking about when reflecting on your question, Max, that, you know, the, the, the bigger companies have that uh, bandwidth to invest in innovation, but also the absorptive capacity to be able to take on trial, adopt and implement new ways of working and new technologies and innovation. So it's really important that we uh, retain that, that capability and that market pull for new innovations. And everyone, if you're not already a member of Agritech E, we'll put a link onto Belinda's site after this on the follow-up email. Have a look at it because it's a very well, well, very worthwhile group to, to join for the, we just, only have to listen to, to Belinda to, to understand that. Uh, just, just a quest, question, in, which is quite a pertinent one in the respect of the politics of the, of the retail system. With a huge number of outlets across the country, why can't the main retailers take advantage of their network to deliver quality fresh goods even in the same delivery stores that can serve in a five mile radius, like direct to store order and picking, or even to a farm shop, technology can serve, can serve for sure. Uh, just give an example, a, a chap I know who uh, runs a, a, a really successful um, apple juice business in, uh, in Suffolk, um, his orders have gone down, he's fine, uh, but he's got a couple of delivery vehicles and he approached um, Sainsbury's locally um, to see whether he could start doing deliveries for them to, to um, ease the, uh, the, the issues and to make sure that um, those people who are not getting food are, are getting food. Um, he went to see the store manager, gave him his card, and that was a week ago and has heard nothing since. 
Um, Nigel, what's your view within within the politics of of, of retail here? It, is this are, are we still going to have our silo of, of things? No, no, no. Or, or is no, it all going to get broken down? Or probably the store manager was rather busy himself, and um, <laughs> probably he had some issues with staff not uh, being able to come into work. And, but I, I actually think there's some interesting food service businesses that I know are already talking to so, uh, some of the retailers um, about utilisation of vehicle. And I think that's probably more where you're going to start to see that. And, and, and the point was made earlier, wasn't it? You know, we've only been, I think, 10 days. They've only just managed to get people to queue in a straight line outside the store. So, so I think, I think, uh, so operationally, they've only just managed to try to get the shelves full. But I think that that's where some of the smart people will say, well, we've got, we've got capability of people and, uh, and, and vehicles, and what, what can we do together? And, uh, and the fact that the government has loosened the fact that they can all talk in a, in a collaborative way, I, I, think you will, I think you will see some innovation on that front for sure. Okay, and in Austria, Retail um, in Austria in comparison to retail in the UK, uh, what, what's it like? Um, you don't, so, so Aldi and Lidl would be really quite dominant. And then thereafter, it's quite um, regional. So Spa um, would be big in Salzburg. And then there's a business um, in Innsbruck called Emprise. But it doesn't have the scale. All the stores are smaller. People tend to, uh, as I said earlier, they'll go to farms to buy fresh produce. They'll go to... Uh, uh, a butcher to buy their meat so it's um, very it's it's very as it was you know in the 70s in the uk before the uh, the retailers became truly dominant um and um it, yeah you can't it's it's a totally different marketplace it's not like the uk uh, at all okay and food and then, on and, and food on shelf where, where if you went today to your local store mm. um at how, how is it well stocked to, yeah they've got issues where because because I think for the for the people here it's actually become real when you when you're locked away for so long, um, and also bear in mind it it northern Italy from where I am is only two to three hours in the car, so it's actually it's more real. I think in the UK what you'll find is uh, the fact that the prime minister is is now with the virus, the fact that you'll they'll start to show horrible pictures of the hospitals as they have been showing in Italy and Spain. I think you'll find that it will scare people and they will be uh, much more cautious about going out. So it's been quite difficult for the UK, a lot of the public in the UK to get their heads around um, the virus. It, it, in Austria, uh, it's been really pushed hard and, they've been, and they're closer to Italy. It, the people here are pretty scared, actually, particularly right. the old people. Okay, and, and, and guys, just to run around everyone um, as to what their, their stores are physically looking, looking like. So my uh, Sainsbury's, my uh, local co-op, I'd say are, are 50%. N Nigel, can you just watch your mic on your, uh, on your cheek? Because it's, it's just scratching a little bit. Um, guys, so my, my local Sainsbury's and my local co-op, I'd say is 40, 50% um, of its normal um, uh, stock. Um, Belinda, what's, what, what's it like around you? Uh, so the co-op in Fordham uh, was pretty good, actually. Lots of fresh produce. Pretty much everything you would want that they normally have uh, was in there. They just had a delivery of milk. Uh, so that was not bad. Toilet rolls, not so great. But uh, in terms of fresh produce, that seemed to have been working. I also went to a co-op in Norwich and they were even better stocked. So I haven't been to any of the big multiples myself, but certainly the, the co-op, who I think had made a made a, a, a different statement and a different decision uh, they were doing pretty good the, in my experience okay mark where you are what's it like um well i i had a fever for three days about uh, 14 days ago so i haven't actually i've hardly been out of the house uh literally um but what i can tell you from the data that i see on the various retailer um information system is that their in-store availability went down from sort of an average of 90, 95% down to 50. So we had a period of time where the shelves were half, literally half the stores had nothing on the shelf at the end of the day. That has now come back up to about 70%. So across the whole system, we're seeing product is getting back into store. And from friends and family, I, I believe that is now falling through. And they'll be back in properly, hopefully, by the end of uh, by the beginning of next week. Okay, Rob, you have ten million neighbours where you're currently living in London. Oh, it's it like been, there? Um, I would say far worse than fifty percent. Um, uh, and and um, 
and there was plenty of wine until about three days ago, then that got stripped out. So that's, it's, you know, it's priorities really. Um, but I was at Borough Market uh, last Saturday, um, and there was an amazing uh, selection of great products there. Um, so let's, let's hope that people will approach the market to respect the two meter rule, but um, I can't see any difference in, from a health and safety perspective in a, in a, in a market to a supermarket. So, um, you know, maybe it's a chance to do that. I don't know whether that's any safer or less, but I, but I know that the variety and the, and the quality of the products and often the prices are very attractive. So, and I think this is what's happening across the UK. People are rethinking their, their habits for lots of reasons. In, you know, going into um, an enclosed environment is pretty, pretty worrying. And so anything that's uh, out of town or, or, or in an open area like market is, is much more attractive. Um, so yeah, it's pretty good. That's, that's, I think that's, that's what's why it's changing. Well done, Rob. A, a month ago, we were all talking about uh, the climate, the effect of the climate of, uh, of us. We had Greta um, presenting, protesting at uh, the, the lights of uh, uh, Bristol uh, t Town Centre. Got an interesting question in that I'm just going to throw at Mark. And uh, Mark, I apologise for throwing it at, at you, but you'll you understand why. Uh, from an anonymous um, uh, attendee, how can supply chains be shortened and made more robust? Won't consumers uh, be concerned for climate and remote supply if we continue to fly produce around the world? Um, it's a really interesting one because we, we're very aware of our carbon footprint. Um, and actually, we, we're in the middle, we were in the middle of a big new carbon footprinting program. But we did one a few years ago. And because of our product, so once you've cut and peeled a mango, you only fly 30% of it. It's only refrigerated for 24 hours before it arrives in market, whereas a whole head mango coming across from South America is three weeks on the water in a refrigerated container. It then spends two weeks in refrigerated storage here. So the, the carbon story is, is not as simplistic as many people think. It's like plastic packaging. Plastic packaging is brilliant. You look at a a cucumber that's wrapped in plastic lasts three or four times as long as a cucumber that isn't, and therefore you don't get food waste. Um, the answer is actually for us to do the right things, not the things that make headlines. And flying um, cut fruit rather than whole head is more carbon um, effective. So it needs a bit of um, thought and people making the right decisions. And, and Mark, the other bit I always like to um, promote, especially with, a, with an amazing business like, like Blue Skies, how many people do Blue Skies employ in Ghana? Um, anything up to three and a half, four thousand people. We're one of the largest um, private employers in the country. And 22 years ago, Anthony Pyle, our chairman, built a factory in the middle of a field where the nearest large town was 20 minutes, half an hour away. We now have a town of 36,000 who yep. exist off the factory. Um, we've increased skills in the area, we've upped the whole um, local economy. And that, that is also the difference, is when you do this properly, um, you create jobs, you create livelihoods in areas that desperately need it. And you return the value back to the country where it comes from, rather than relying on very poorly paid agricultural workers bringing the product over to the Western world, whether that's the US or, or Europe, and adding all the value here. That's just not right. We need to do it in the right place. Uh, thank you. There's a, there's a point I was going to make about that as well. That, um, we, we've spoken about it. That's, um, um, I, I've, so one of the frustrations I've got is that story about the, e the likes of the ecosystem, the 35,000 people that, um, that, that work off the, um, the blue, blue skies model on Accra. Um, the, in the UK, no one knows that. No, no one hears that. And, and you, you and I have had a conversation slash argument um, that if, uh, if I'm saying that if you put a, a, a face of a little boy from Accra uh, with his mum, uh, who's just come back from um, uh, work, working within, within Blue Skies, would that, would that not help sell more fresh produce? And, and your, your view is that that may not. But I still think there's, there's a there's this big need to educate the consumer. Six out of 10 kids don't know where fruit and veg um, comes from. And that's one of the reasons why we, we set up Beanstalk Global to look to um, educate the consumer as to where amazing fresh fruit comes from. Yeah, you, you, you absolutely. Well, educate though, because people don't want to be educated. They want to be engaged. And uh, usually, yep. to with you, sorry, uh, Max, but you know, um, I want to enjoy my food and enjoy the stories behind it. And the new technologies that with, Belinda was talking about earlier on is actually spot on, but that, that 
finding ways to hear about that. It's also worth remembering in sustainable development goals set by the UN, just as important as the environment is a sustainable economies. Mm. And, and that's actually, that's a part of the uh, 17 uh, goals. So um, providing that is the case and that there's enough money going into the, the local economy from the business that's doing that, then it's seen as the right level of income for those people relative to their economy. And that is, a, that's a key, key worldwide goal for the whole of the UN. Mm. Absolutely, and you've got organizations like um, Albert Hein, Waitrose and Blue Skies who have a foundation that invests in local uh, education, local uh, IT facilities and things like that. And there are many, many companies around the world that do that. We just forget to tell anyone about it. Mm. And I think Max is right in many ways that, that the fresh produce industry does change economies and change local areas. And we are very bad at telling people about it. But the biggest reason is that the vast majority of our product now is not under our branded control. And um, you know, when you're in a retail market that is so price orientated, they don't want to talk about the added value side. All they want to do is talk about price. And that's the fundamental of our entire industry. When you look across the acceptable margins in the fresh produce industry are two or three percent. It's, it's not sustainable. Crazy. And that's something that we need to address in time as well. Uh, Mark, whilst, whilst I remember, just uh, tell us, show off about your amazing ice cream. Ah, we, um, so again, Anthony has these uh, mad ideas, um, and we have He's, he's of, not mad. He's, he's not he's mad. Not, <laughs> but some of his ideas can be quite challenging. Um, and we have lots of coconuts in Ghana. And he saw that a coconut milk looks a bit like a dairy cow's milk, and surely you can make ice cream out of it. So we've produced uh, a dairy-free ice cream that I would challenge anyone to eat and not as enjoy as much as many of the dairy ice creams. Um, and I've seen it in my own eyes as buyers taste the product and their eyes light up. Um, and that's made in Ghana uh, using local produce straight off the tree. Uh, you can almost see the coconut grow from the factory. Um, and, and it is fantastic. So Cardo, Waitrose, Amazon Online, Please go and buy it. Well, well done. <laughs> Guys, just, just go back to the supply chain element, and I think I probably said this in the, in the last webinar, there's so much profit, profitability held up within the supply chain, especially when um, you guys are all operating on such wafer-thin margins. Uh, Nigel, there's a, a question here. When will the retailers take more responsibility for their volume requirement? Recent years, they've preferred to be very vague, um, and as such, commit to clear supply demand. Uh, Nigel, with your retailer hat on and your supplier hat on, what's your views, please? Uh, I think um, I think the high quality retailers now are um, much more engaged, much more planned with their suppliers. I mean, it's mm. it's not now um, uncommon for people to have a, at least a five year contract with a with a retailer on fresh produce, and then work in a collaborative way on forecasting. So I think I'm not sure the background of the person's question, but um, I think. Certainly, with the yeah, the the, the, the more more well known retailers are are much more partnership based now. So, I don't really recognise that. I think it was like that maybe five years ago, but it certainly uh, it certainly moved into a different place as far as I'm concerned. And, and do do you think that the the, the likes of the good, the very good work that uh, Christine Takeon's done with the Grocery Code Adjudicator Department? Do you think that's also assisted within UK retail? Uh, oh, maybe to a degree, but I do feel that r the retailers have realised that actually to gain competitive advantage to try to drive cost out, it's better to be collaborative in the long term um, than actually try to negotiate um, the hell out of a supplier, push them into yeah. the ground. And, I, and again, as I say, the, the bigger retailers, and, and, uh, and, and I would say, so if you take Tesco's case in point, that they, they, they have got long-term agreements with most of their fresh produce uh, suppliers. Yeah. And uh, that's a hell of an improvement from where it has. And whether Christine had anything to do with that, I, no. I can't comment. Well, well said, Nigel. And it's probably a conversation for another time. But you, you look at some mm. of the success stories of late. If you look at the FPJ Top 50 and you see the likes of uh, the uh, DPS, direct, direct Produce Supplies, jump 18 places um, in one year. Uh, because of what they've set up in the way of um, integrated service solutions and also just basically asking uh, Tesco's, what is your problem? Because we can solve it. Mm. And, and ditto with the likes of um, MMUK slash AMT Fresh. They've gone 
again, same retailer, they've gone to the retailer and, and said, what's your problem? Because we can create the solution. Um, and there's that trust, and they've, they've got the, I believe, the associated five-year contracts that you've alluded to, rather than this day-to-day -day trading basis. Yeah. There's also, Max, there's the, um, the increase in data enables predictive modeling, predictive crop modeling to match supply and demand and reduce waste. And that's being done for a lot of fresh produce uh, crop now, which is using retailer data to predict demand on a particular weekend and then uh, data of weather, soil conditions, growth rates of the crop, seeing that across a lot of, a lot of crops now, which is helping to really tighten up that supply demand piece. I think yeah. the data play is huge as well. We're working with the genetics company um, in machine learning for um, plant selection, and they've they've reduced the selection time purely by mathematical calculations by five times, eighty percent reduction in time. So seven years down to uh, eighteen months, purely by look uh, processing the data. So AI, call it what you like, but um, yeah. it's a, it's incredible things going on out there that are going to transform costs and efficiency. So um, it's really exciting. The, um, we're, okay, just come back from the States from an algae business, and um, we see the 75% reduction in fertilizer needed with algae treated plants and a doubling of shelf life. So, the fruit guys, very interesting area, what's going on there? You see, looking at strawberries that were double the normal shelf life and taste just better, actually. Uh, so, you know, do that to raspberries, do that to blueberries, they're, they're, they're trying them out on all those crops. Out. It's fascinating what's going to happen. And that produces oxygen as a, um, as a treatment. You know, it's amazing. So, Really, really huge leaps in technologies that, that are going to make all of this work better. Rob, well done. Guys, we're, we're running out of time and I'm, I haven't got any more money for the, for the meter. Um, so just to, <laughs> just to wrap up, just to, uh, each of you individually, just to try and summarise this title, uh, just in a, in a line, in a paragraph, what would your advice be to growers, producers, um, as we get through the, the other end of this, um, hopefully the other, other end of this period, what is your advice to growers and producers? Mark, let's, let's start with you, please. Um, work hand in hand with a really good direct consumer organisation. There are alternative routes and retailers and find those ones. Well done. Uh, Nigel. Well, I actually think the experience of the grower and the, and the, and the, and the high quality retailers that hopefully they are supplying will actually galvanise their, uh, their relationships and make them both stronger would be my, my observation. Excellent. Roberto. I think it's telling that story, lifting the lid on, on uh, making it a transparent, engaging, fun world about produce. People are fascinated about farming and farmers. Yeah. So um, turn that, use the digital technologies that are coming along to uh, tell the story. It, 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 it's a lot more interesting than you think it is um, to yourselves. It's too, too close to it. But um, there's been great posts on LinkedIn about people watching apples go down a production line. And that yeah. is interesting. So, you know, it's a lot of people that's just an apple, but it actually is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, open the lid to the transparent world that it should be for where our food comes from, because it really matters to us now. You, you, you've stolen some of our thing, thinking that we want to uh, set up a, a set of viral w videos for Beanstalk.Global. And Mark and I uh, briefly talked about it, but we, we'd love to go out to, uh, to his site in, in Ghana and to, to film some amazing things happening with pineapple. So, so watch this space on, uh, on, on that side. Uh, Belinda. Uh, be open-minded to the role of innovation. If you lack the bandwidth to be able to invest in, uh, explore it yourself, partner with those who can. Wow, crikey, I'm gonna encapsulate that. Uh, so guys, th thank you very much. Um, as we wrap up, I just got to thank our sponsors again, uh, who without their um, assistance and uh, their, their trust in us, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And also with what we're going to present in the, in the future, we'd like to thank you, our viewers, uh, we're only uh, second one in, but uh, we had a thousand views on, on the first one. And, and looking at the stats here, I think we're already up to a thousand on, on this webinar. So that's fantastic. Uh, I need to thank our speakers again because they've very kindly come in at very short notice. Um, and some of these guys know each other and some of them don't. So just throw them in a big pot together and going for it takes a, takes a, a, a lot of faith. So, so thank you. Uh, our next webinar is next Tuesday, the 21st at 2 p.m. Uh, GMT time. Uh, we've got um, uh, a really impressive guy who's an ex-CEO of a major food service business. We might have a TV star. We've definitely got a CEO of a very large uh, veg, veg business, and we might have a uh, very interesting uh, chef. So watch out for the marketing. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, thank you for enjoying Beanstalk.Global. We'd love you to join us as we continue in this adventure. Be safe, be well with all of your family, please. Thank you. Thanks for the excuse for wearing shirts. Thanks, Max. <laughs> Thanks, Max.
Well done, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.